So, hi, I'm Martin. Um, I'm from Ed Everywhere Digital. We do sort of like websites, web apps, that sort of thing. We've been working with Ember for about, probably about a year now. It's pretty cool. So, yeah, I no, just sort of wanted to talk about our experiences with it and sort of where we've gone with our development process. And, um, and that involves a sort of a development style like called Atomic Web Design or Web Development and how that works with web components and Ember components. Um, so, further ado. Um, so, when I first started doing this stuff, it was uh, quite a lot to get around, like the whole web components thing's like quite a shift in how we do things. So, I kind of felt like that. It's just like, Dah! what's what's going on? Um, and then I started reading about it a bit more and I was like, yeah, okay, cool. You know, I'm kind of, kind of getting hang and and then I was like, yeah, bring it on. And it's cool. So um, firstly, what are web components? Um, they're kind of a, a new way of building for the web. Like traditionally, we think about things in terms of pages and um, buttons and all those sort of things. But web components is sort of um, taking it into sort of more building blocks and more pieces. And it's a, uh, secondarily, secondarily, it's a collection of W3C standards um, for devs to use that have more or less been used by uh, browser vendors for quite some time, but they're now sort of being released and standardized for the public, so that's pretty cool. And in effect, what they actually are is encapsulated bundles of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so like nice little packages that can sort of be reused. Um, so they're made up kind of of four things. Uh, first, I want to say that most of this present, well, a chunk of this presentation about web components is uh, liberally plundered from Eric Beidelman, who's a you know a Google evangelist. His Google I/O 2013 presentation is amazing. You should read it, like watch it. It's got heaps about web components. But so this part here is sort of like taken from that. Um, so web components are kind of four things: HTML templates, which are kind of chunks of markup that can be reused and um, repurposed, much like Ember templates can. So, um, and then there's Shadow DOM. I don't know how much you guys have used Shadow DOM, but it's kind of um, like a layer that sits under the traditional uh, DOM that we have. So kind of, and it has DOM and style encapsulation built into custom elements. So custom elements are sort of, um, you know, like uh, style, uh, like input tags and uh, text fields and all of those. And they have sort of a functionality within them that is available only to the browser or um, is sort of created within the browser that as a developer, you can't really access. So um, you can kind of create new and, and expand upon existing elements like input fields and all of those um, using custom elements. And then finally, it's like HTML imports, which allows you to take these new custom elements and bits and pieces and web components that you've created and import them into a new document. So, um, templates. Yeah, so you can use um, HTML and markup directly on the DOM. Um, they're hidden from the document. They just show like as a custom element. So it will just look like a, in any old tag. So it could be something like uh, Ember London tag that, that you use and that's all it shows and it's passed, not rendered. So script tags that are within it or any images or anything aren't loaded until you sort of tell it to say, um, tell it to, to load those things. Um, sorry if I'm going through this quite fast, there's, there's quite a lot about it. So definitely read um, Eric Beidelman or watch Eric Beidelman's uh, presentation. Um, Shadow DOM, so it's like markup encapsulation and style boundaries for custom elements. And to kind of show you what I mean, I will load up this. Hold on. So, just make this a bit bigger. This is a date sort of input tag, and you can see here that it's input date type. So that's that's a sort of a, a web component in itself. But usually you can't go into it, but if you click this thing and you go here, uh, it says show user agent shadow DOM, it opens up the shadow DOM for you. So it allows you to, to go into this custom element and opens up all that stuff within there. So you can kind of see 
It's got all these custom styles and all these different things that usually you can't access. So it's usually it would just be an input tag, but they've actually the browser vendors have you know been doing this for a long time that they've made you know these um, input tags and input fields um, with pure HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And so you can kind of access and see all of that within um, within the Shadow DOM. Cool. Uh, so. Um, Custom HTML elements, that's basically what, what these things are. So you can make new ones instead of just like using a regular input tag. You can do something like an Ember London tag, which can be used like any standard DOM element, like Ember London, like that. But it will have all these sort of custom JavaScript, CSS, and HTML sort of within it that a regular user won't actually be able to, to see unless they open it up within the Shadow DOM. And then they'll sort of get all the access to it. And you can also extend existing elements. So for example, if you wanted to, create a custom sort of input field, you can, you can extend that whole language just like you can like classes and that sort of thing. Um, HTML imports, so this is pretty cool. So once people have started making all of these custom elements and all these like web components, they can actually, just like an HTML file, sort of like a chunk of code, be imported into any document and then be made available to sort of any, anyone who wants to use them. So we could import the Ember London um, uh, DOM element and we can use that in our script. So it's a really, really nice way of sharing like all these like custom components that you can build. So support for web components. Um, it's kind of like Chrome obviously has it and then Opera because it, it's basically Chrome has it as well. Firefox kind of and IE and Safari obviously don't because they're awful. Um, however, using Platform.js and the Polymer framework, which is um, sort of a framework for web components. It has full availability and polyfills for basically for everything. So it brings in um, support for pretty much all browsers. Now, how does this relate to M components? Ember components, if you guys have seen them and used them, are effectively Ember's take on web components, and they're heavily based off the W3C standards for web components. So it allows you to do all the same sort of very similar things of having the um, contained chunks of code and uh, markup. Very easy to translate over, uh, except the differences are they use handlebars templates instead of HTML and sort of uh, CSS templates. And you have a controller, so effectively you have a component controller instead of often inline JavaScript, so like a script tag within an HTML file. So it's, that's, that's the primary differences. Other than that, obviously, you've got all the access to Ember's awesome functionality as well. So um, now it's kind of like, what the hell is actually this atomic design thing? So atomic design is kind of a, a way of structuring your design and code into reusable components. And you can kind of see how, where this is going now, sort of with the whole building things as components and really modular, modularizing things rather than thinking of things as pages and different elements on a page, thinking everything as reusable chunks. Um, so yeah, we're not designing pages, we're designing systems of components. And this again goes into the whole concept of reusability. So the more you can create reusable chunks of code, the more you're sort of saving your time down the line and you can just sort of really rearrange and, and put these things together. And, and also from a user perspective, if these things are the same, a user will actually sort of know and understand how to, to use them because they've seen how they work already. Um, now it's kind of broken down into into three parts, um, atoms, molecules, and organisms. Um, Brad Frost is one of the guys who sort of really pioneered this idea. It's worth checking out his stuff, so patternlab.io. He's got lots of stuff, he talks about it, but he goes on to um, pass, so he says atoms, molecules, organism, pages, but I, I don't really like to think of pages because I sort of think things are more um, going in the way of states, and r rather than thinking of pages, think of things in terms of states and templates. Um, so, First thing is atoms. So these are the building blocks of a website. So buttons, text, label, input. So you can see here it's a, just a nice old input field. So that would be kind of an atom, like the smallest chunk of, um, of code that you can think of. 
And then um, you've, you've got molecules. So it's kind of when you, you chuck a few of these different components, to, uh, these few atoms together, you get something which is like a molecule. And um, so something like a search bar, for example. And then you throw a few more together and you get a organism which is a sort of a distinct section of interface. So in this case, a navigation. So trying to think of things in terms of reusable blocks and building them up into um, bigger and bigger parts. Um, and then, yeah, obviously you get to a level where you're building applications. So it can be thought of like traditional templates, but I kind of like to think of it in terms of states. So rather than having all your separate pages, you sort of transition between different states and turning things on and off. Um, I think with single page web apps, and especially with the power that Ember has, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, frees up your way of thinking rather than thinking of things as in pages, which is kind of like a traditional website based thing. So that's kind of where I think the future of web design is going, where it's sort of like basically building these Lego blocks that you can share and reuse and sort of put together and construct new things from these different parts of um, different web components that you can all sort of put together. Um, you know, and I, I think it's a really powerful way of building things because once you've got these reusable chunks of code, you don't have to um, redesign things every time. So you, you've kind of got like a really, really powerful tool set that you can go into any project with. And that's made really, really easy by Ember. So uh, this presentation is all made out of atomic Ember components. So this is it's all done in Ember. Um, so this here is kind of a uh, might be hard to read it, but um, so these are sort of uh, there's like a slide component here, um, and that that sort of has all the different elements within a slide, and then there's a footer component, and um, there's uh, the button component. So each one of those, the pieces in the presentation, is actually um, built up built up of these atomic ember components. So a slide organism, footer molecule, next previous button molecules, bullet, um, bullets, and so on and so forth. So I've kind of created these reusable chunks that you've kind of seen to use and within this presentation. Um, so some thoughts on how we are sort of developing with atomic design in Ember. Um, we kind of use routes to control more which elements are visible on a page rather than um, controlling sort of having pages as such so from each route we kind of turn on and off all the different all the, all the different uh, components that we've sort of um, pulled in we use controllers primarily as classes and functions to control stuff rather than having all um, all the sort of like having page content and dealing with it as pages we, we use we use them more as a, a way of like putting together um, and controlling all these different molecules and um, components that we've created. Um, so yeah, Ember components primarily as reusable molecules. Um, encapsulation and events, I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, but, and the other thing is that helpers are your friends. So uh, Ember helpers are awesome. So definitely look into those and use them. It help, helps sort of cut down on um, putting too much stuff into your, into your controllers. Um, so, encapsulation and events. So one of the core things about um, components is that they shouldn't require any knowledge about their parents. So you have to, you know, you have to sort of quite think quite heavily if you want something to have any knowledge about its parent, you have to pass it through. So um, giving access to any parent stuff, you have to declare um, like quite clearly that you're going to do that. And any events that you want to have a reaction outside of the component, you trigger an event within that component that is then spread out to the rest of your application and the rest of your application can choose to deal with that sort of event however it wants. Um, so yeah, if they require variables or even functions, you can pass these in via handlebars and you can sort of got a clear list of what variables and functions are passed into them. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks uh, for your time. Um, some useful links here. Um, I'll put this up online and then post it in the Ember Discuss um, 
Emmett London thing, so you guys can check it out and go through it again or like get some of the links out of it because definitely worth reading and sort of getting your head around because it's it's really cool. So yeah, thank you. Give it up for Yes. Um, Shadow Dome, beyond yeah. being a cool name. Uh, yeah, it is a cool name. Uh, what is the, uh, what's the primary function of the Shadow Dome? So it's kind of, put it, put it back there, it's like um, the Shadow Dome's kind of there to kind of hide, um, hide stuff from your regular users. So you don't, you know, it, it's, it's, it was primarily there for the browser vendors to put in stuff like, um, input tags and all of those and have them work using HTML, CSS and that, but not actually expose their internals to people. They kind of wanted to, because originally that was done in C, like back in the day, all that sort of uh, input tags and stuff, they were dealt with in C, but they've, they switched over and actually started creating all that stuff in HTML and CSS. And, but they didn't immediately give that access to, to the public to be able to see what they were doing in there. So now they've sort of given over access to, for other developers to create these sort of hidden encapsulated blocks that are able to be used just like traditional DOM elements. Why they've only waited till now to do that, I don't know. Okay. So it's cool. primarily visibility then? Yeah. 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 Um, I like your presentation. Is that something that you can make available? Or um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I literally built this in about two hours last night. So I kind of, I only got back from overseas on Monday, so I kind of ran out of time. But um, I, I, I'm more than happy to put up the source code to it so you can check it out. I'll put it up um, along with the, uh, um, with this link on a, on a link. I'll, I'll just chuck it in a link there and make a GitHub. Just another for it. question about the components. How big can the components get? Do you think, can you encapsulate whole workflows or is this something that's really... You generally want to try and like, well what we've tried to do is try and break everything down into smaller chunks. Like if you're getting to the point that something's more than maybe a few different molecules or atoms put together, you it's probably more a few different molecules that you can have like interact with each other. And like I was saying about having your controller more as a... Um, your sort of roots and controllers more acting as a sort of a bridge that you can kind of have your different um, your different web components kind of talk to each other and then feed back to a central unit and then you can have different components listen to to each thing so they're all sort of these independently acting things that can all listen out and see what's going on but we try and break them down as much as possible. Yeah. I would just have a button with a class name. Yeah. And give an action. Yeah. And that would do mostly what I'm running. Yeah. Like, I mean, so that's where the, you've kind of got the two parts there. You've got the whole atomic design thing and you've got the whole web components thing. I mean, buttons are straight away or, or you know, already a kind of um, a, a very minimal level of the atomic design. It's just, it's an atom. So you don't really need to do much with it. Right. It's kind of, it just sits as an atom. So it's kind of when you start getting to the uh, molecules and organisms that you start talking about turning those into web components. Um, like, there's also lots of stuff about how you integrate this in with CSS. So a lot of um, uh, uh, the Pattern Lab stuff is actually about how you structure your CSS um, to in an atomic way, so everything's reusable and really clear. So actually, that's that's where a lot of this comes from. Is actually how you structure your CSS to 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 make it clearer. Like there's an there's a few other ones. There's another sort of um, pattern called Smacks. Don't know if anyone's heard about that. That's another way for structuring your CSS to make it sort of like clean and reusable chunks. But I found the atomic sort of way kind of really logical. So you have a button, then you might have a blue button, red button yellow button and, and those sort of different variables or ways of sort of um, changing those. But that wouldn't really become a web component until you needed to stick functionality into it, if that makes sense. Cool. Um, so with the CSS <coughs> um, stuff, is that packaged up with the web component? Right. So in traditional web components, not Ember components, so in, in the sort of W3C standards, yes. 
um, you actually have a whole HTML file and that has your JavaScript, your CSS and your HTML all sitting in there like, you know, like we used to do years and years ago before we pulled in you know, files, like having everything in, you know, when I first started coding, I just put everything in one massive HTML file and it was horrible. But it's kind of funny because it's gone full circle to actually, you do that. So you have your script tag, you have your CSS tag, and you have your, your HTML and everything all in one HTML file that you can then pull in via imports. Ember doesn't kind of do it that way. That's one of the things that the sort of Ember components don't, they kind of do split out CSS, your JavaScript, and your, um, templates into three files, so you'll have your handlebars template, your kind of controller, and well, and the Ember controllers has your, you know, um, all that stuff in it, and then you have your CSS separate. So Ember components do split them out, but in web components, yeah, they're all actually together. So does that mean that, uh, I mean, is it not, I haven't thought through this fully, but if, if, let's say you have <coughs> two or three components on a page, and they're yeah. all underlying them is they're using the Ember or they're using jQuery or they're using some sort of yeah. third party dependency. Yeah. They're all kind of embedding that into there so it becomes quite inefficient. Quite a it can do. I, I don't know exactly how the efficiency works with web components if they share, I mean that's one thing I've wondered about as well. I know they are encapsulated so for example if you are making, um, if you've got CSS styles and certain things within one of these web components, it won't affect any other web component on that page. It will all be entirely encapsulated. So you don't have to worry about different web components messing with each other. However, I don't know about the efficiency thing, whether you need to um, have require for the modules or if you pull them in if they share them. I think that's something that I was wondering about as well and how you can improve efficiency with them. So that's definitely something to sort of look into, or something I'm going to look into, if that makes sense. <laughs> cool. So uh, after the first time I talked to you about this, I had a go into member apps I was working on, oh, yeah. and I found that what I would do over and over again is accidentally kind of build too many presentation styles into the, I guess, molecule yeah. itself and make it too difficult to override, and then yeah. have, end up having to yank some of those styles out and leave in just the ones that dealt purely with structure. Yeah. Do you have any rules of thumb that you've come across for how, like, where, where to stop adding CSS to a, an atom or a molecule to leave it open to other things? That's a good question. I do try and keep it mostly structural and then have sort of, um, I don't know, sort of ways of uh, variables sort of that I can then pass into it to change its structure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, using SCSS, yes, yes, you're talking about a, on a CSS level? CSS yeah, level. yeah, yeah. So, I then will have a sort of the main structure of it and then I'll have um, within using SCSS a few variances that I can then have so button, red button, red large button. So you can then just semantically start putting in these things that change it but I try and keep those separate and as minimal as possible okay. so that you, yeah, so because uh, we had that problem heaps as well, you start having too many sort of variables that start messing with it. So I try and have it primarily structural and then separate out any sort of ones that I want to change it with. Yeah, because I, I went the route of uh, setting tag name to be a custom tag name yeah. and then putting the, the kind of fundamental styles on that. But of course they get precedence over everything else because they're on a tag rather yeah. than a class or an ID. And then it made it really hard to override and have to like rewind yeah, yeah, it, that's, it's just some taking a, like, getting the hang of sort of, yeah, yeah. I've, it's, it's sort of like a work in progress for us to figuring out where those sort of pitfalls are and like how the best way to structure things are so you don't have to sort of yank it out, but generally we try and keep it structural and then just have anything that changes it as modifiers, as extra classes, so we can just put those in and, and try and keep them quite uniform and consistent and not change things too much in different pages. So I think a thing lots of people do is like have CSS styles that change things on a different page, but if you actually need to have something different on a different page, add a new class that's a modifier that will then change it to be that, if, if you get what I mean. So you can say like, oh actually I need one to be full width, have a new modifier that's full width. So you can then start reusing these different words to actually make it do what you want, but then you could actually use those in different places as well. In terms of atoms and molecules, uh, or there, is there a momentum behind at, at a certain level of granularity? I mean, what, what, what's taking off in terms of you know being able to plug and play these things in? And, and the second part of that question is, 
you know, in the stuff that's out there right now, are we actually seeing contributions from the design community and that these are actually, you know, you're really getting uh, design reads rather than just technical reads? Yeah, I, th I think like that's the two parts of it because the whole atomic thing, I think it comes down to your preference. The atomic thing is very much a like, well, how big is a molecule? How big is an organism? It's kind of up to the designer or the developer to choose how big they are. But with web components, I think like the whole polymer framework and stuff is really taking off and there. there's quite a lot of, um, you know, there, people are starting releasing different web components that people can use. So that is um, actually getting some momentum behind it. But yeah, the, I mean, the, the sort of atomic thing is very much more of a, um, a stylistic and a, a way for people to kind of get their head around structuring things. And it will depend a bit more from designer to and developer, like what what you prefer to use and what sort of works for you, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Cool. Right, cool. Cool. One, one last stand. Yeah. Cheers. Woo!